Tell me more about the edge of the internet. I mean, where where is the edge of the internet? I know it's connected somewhere to the cloud. There's the cloud and there's the edge. Yeah, and, and then there's a bunch of stuff in the middle, right? This is just the grumpy old man shaking fists at clouds, right? Get to it, do it fast. Right here. On the Innycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here. On the Innycast. So, without further ado, I am here with the man, the one and only New Hampshire tech guru, Tom Daly. How the hell are you? Hey, Matt. How you doing? Very, uh, very good, sir. I'm well. Well, uh, th- first of all, thanks for being here, wherever here virtually is in in the cloud. Um, for those who don't know you, can you give me the the, the backstory and, and who you are, how we got here? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So my name's Tom Daly. Uh, I'm sitting in Nashville, New Hampshire. Uh, been a long time New Hampshire resident, born and raised here. Um, the backstory is that in the late 90s, I had a friend whose parents were running a, you know, what we would call today a managed service provider, right? A, a PC shop and they were, uh, you know, performing services for local IT services for local businesses. And this guy told me one day about, you know, what it takes to build a dial up ISP. And I got really interested in what he had to t- tell me. And, uh, I was like in high school at the time. And I said, I'm going to go figure out how to get a job at an ISP because I think this is really cool. Like being on the, being online is very cool to begin with. I already had like some like AOL dial up account or something like that. I think I started with AOL Mm. and, uh, I'm like, well, what does it take to build an ISP? And, you know, like as like 14, 15 year old kids started putting together a resume and like put it out to a couple local ISPs and really none of them called me back except for one. Uh, it was this guy, his name is Gent Cab. He's still in the business today. And at the time he ran Metro 2000 internet services and he was like, yeah, come check it out. Right. Like come see our ISP. And, you know, this was in Manchester, New Hampshire, big mill buildings, uh, Manchester's on a river. So there's a history of, um, you know, uh, uh fabric manufacturing and shoe manufacturing and all those mills used, uh, the, the water power from the river. But, uh, so now, you know, now these mill buildings, you can rent space. You used to be able to rent space in them dirt cheap. So that's where Gent had Metro 2000 internet services. And he invited me up to check it out. And I remember being so excited to go see what this ISP was all about because they had, you know, they had a T1 line. Ooh. And I was like, Gent, show me the T1 line. I can't wait to see this thing. Right. And he points to a piece of plywood on the wall and there's a little RJ 48 X Jack. And he's like, well, that's what it is. And it was like the biggest letdown in the world. Like I was expecting some fat cable on the wall, but anyways, uh, got the start in the industry, uh, working dial up technical support for a local internet service provider. Uh, Jen was a fantastic mentor and, uh, I learned a lot about network design, network engineering, you know, various protocols, very, very hands on uh, learning experience and went off to university and met up with the, uh, the founder of DineDNS.org, a gentleman by the name of Tim Wild, and decided that I wanted to do something a little bit bigger than the ISP and jumped over to DineDNS.org in the same role, you know, tech technical support. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there really just processed a lot of tickets every day for a while until one day I got really frustrated with our web app. And realized that our web app was just running users into like a dead wall every time they click through a certain, you know, sequence and flow in the app and couldn't get developer time to pay attention to it. So I was like, well, this is, this is like Perl and HTML Mason. I had taken a couple programming classes in high school. Like I can figure this out and just started writing some code Mm. and got a little incrementally better and better and better at it. And eventually became, you know, after about five years, became the chief technology officer at Dyne. And that was at a phase where, you know, we were building the business and we were deciding what we were going to do with DynDNS. And we decided to go up market away, you know, keep our consumer business. But we also wanted to have something that was uh, relevant to uh, businesses and enterprises. And that's when we built out the Dynect managed DNS platform. I can speak a little bit more about that later. Um, It was our first, first foray into the world of Anycast IPv4 networking. 
and you know took on the role of like chief architect and CTO for the Dynect network. Speeding forward one more time, had a really challenging customer at Dyn at Dynect called Arthur Bergman. Uh, where hard to believe you know, Arthur would be challenging. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I mean, Arthur's the type of customer that you love and hate at the same time, right? You love him because he challenges you, and you hate him because he challenges you at you know five thirty p.m. on a Friday when you're trying to have like a date out with your girlfriend at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, eventually moved over to Fastly and uh, came in as VP of Infrastructure there and was responsible for building out. The global network at Fastly. In my role, we built that to about 75 points of presence around the globe. Um, you know, 75, I think 76, the scoreboard was connected internet exchange points and about 100 terabit per second of connected edge capacity at the time. And, you know, that's since ex expanded exponentially from there. Um, the thing, you know, at Fastly that we were all pretty excited about is we figured out a way to do networking uh, that didn't require us to go buy big iron routers and big iron load balancers, which, you know, in the CDN industry is, you know, a huge advantage from a capital expenditures standpoint. So, so that was sort of like the learning grounds. And then uh, a couple of years back, got involved with the folks uh, at Big Network and decided to take really sort of the learnings of 20 years and put it into a new venture. Uh, and Big Network is in the business of building software that helps tier two and tier three ISPs deliver resilient connectivity solutions to their business class customers. So we have a, uh, a suite of networking software that helps deliver very, very resilient internet access um, out to the edge of the internet, which in our opinion has you know, traditionally been kind of ignored by the, you know, the software and hardware sectors. Hmm. What, tell me more about the edge of the internet as you see it. Oh, it's such a great question, right? I mean, where, where is the edge of the internet? Yeah. I know I it's mean, connected it be, somewhere to the cloud. There's the cloud and there's the edge and somehow. Yeah. And, and then there's a bunch of stuff in the middle, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so it, there's so many definitions of it. Um, you know, there's like, for a while, some people thought the edge of the internet was like the cell tower, right? Um, you know, there's there's your inter your maybe your terrestrial wired internet access, maybe that's the edge. There's deep edge, far edge. I think Fastly's CTO, so Tyler McMullen has a really great definition of the edge, which is it is whatever the location is where uh, you as the service provider sort of naturally gain control of the handoff from your user, mm. right? Or, or, you know, conversely, as a user, as an eyeball in the network, it's the point at which you lose control over your, essentially your routing policy or your forwarding policy in and out of the network. Yeah. So it's a pretty abstract definition, but I actually think it's like one of the truest definitions of edge that I've seen because it's decoupled from sort of any physical property and it more relates to the topology of the user. And yeah. I think that, you know, in 2024, in a lot of, well, if you go back 20 years, Matt, you know this, like it was all about the physical topology. We have pops and we have stuff, you know, here and there. In, in modern cloud networking, at least I don't know what your experience is, but I see so many so many inefficient latent hairpins around the internet because of the mess of networking we've made mm -hmm. over the past 20 years that, you know, the, the, the physical network looks so different than the logical network at this point yeah. that the edge is not a definition that ties to the physical nature of the network in any way. And I so mean, you need to use a logical definition instead. In, in all of our defenses, it's an elegant mess. It's not just a mess. Um, it's a mess. Yeah, but it there's but but don't you think it's beautiful the fact that it works through the mess? Like I think there's Oh, it, I mean, kudos to the design of IP and TCP and UDP that, you know, these what 40-year-old protocols at this point continue to function the way that they do. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. At a, at a higher, you know, uh, if we go back to the OSI stack, right, at a higher order Absolutely, it's beautiful. But I, but I look at sort of the my my viewpoint on the world tends to be like layer four down. Yeah, and I would say there isn't quite as much beauty in the mess uh, these days. 
And is that what attracted you to working full time and and focused on big networks? Is yeah, I think it's just a very very interesting you know problem space, right? Like, how do you actually sort of analyze and understand the mess, and then try to make intelligent decisions about that mess? Um, mm. You know, one of the things that we did at Fastly, you know, really well. And there's, there's only a handful of companies in the content delivery space. And I believe yourself included at Cashfly, you know, we built our entire global network without building a backbone or acquiring backbone, um, from another, another service provider. And there's only a handful of companies in our space that did that. And the reality of it is to do that, you need a far better understanding of general internet transit topology and the signaling that is available from the network than you get in most cases. A uh, lot more focus on what's going on in the software. And, you know, that has never really translated to, you know, what I will say the customer premise edge, right? At best at yeah. the customer premise edge, we have, you know, for, a, for an enterprise grade circuit, we have BGP routing, right? Well. Right. In the CDN world, we know that BGP routing is not enough, right? Like it may be a routing protocol, but at least in my mind nowadays, I think of it more as a, sig a, a signaling protocol that helps you understand endpoint availability and not much more than that, right? Yes. Uh, it's, it's and a, so it's, it's a state, it's a state awareness protocol, maybe. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, you must know Todd Underwood, right? Yep. So, so Todd, a long, long, long time ago, he just said to me, he goes, look, uh, BGP is just no different than like a, a beacon that an airport would have, you know, an ILA beacon at an airport broadcasting its yeah. location, um, out into the airspace. That's what BGP is for a prefix. Um, mm -hmm. you have no information about latency, congestion, throughput, link size, right? And so you know, take BGP for what it is. A lot of people use it as a routing protocol because we have a routing decision, a generally understood, you know, vendor, somewhat vendor agreed, you know, route decision logic tree that we all use. Um, yeah. But it doesn't provide the information that we need truly to run an efficient network. And so part of the challenge of BIG is we look at that and we say, okay, yes, we have that as an element of the signal, but how do we actually get more? Right. I remember... Uh, the way I think of the, and I like that, and I never heard Todd give that analogy. Todd was actually our third when Barrett and I did the sort of seminal TCP Anycast presentation. Todd, it was actually the three of us because we were using Renesis data to right. to sort of pro provide the insights. And I can't remember why, but he just like no showed to that nano. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, oh, we'll no. do the presentation. And then like the day before, he's like, yeah, I'm not coming. I won't be there. Um, so he was like, you know, on, on the slide deck. But um yeah, so I, I mean, to take that analogy further, it's, it's, um, you know, you have to build the air traffic control infrastructure uh, that actually gets stuff from A to B in a way that makes sense and allows for the fact that you need to space the planes and that sort of thing. But I remember my, my best, oh my God, BGP, what are you talking about? Was um, Years ago, there was there was our Anycast was going something was going into Atlanta instead of Ashburn from somewhere that really should have gone into Ashburn on um, UUNet. So this is on seven hundred one, and eventually it got to whatever tier of technical support person who who basically said no 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 it's working as designed. You can see. Here, clearly, we're deciding because that router in Atlanta has a lower IP address. That's why it's going there. And I was like, as designed, um, right? Like you're, you're, and they were like, yep, no, like they were implying that they had some sort of logical decision making and how they assigned IP addresses to devices that would therefore make BGP make sense. And this, this was working as it should. And so. I think at that point I gave up and went to IRC and said, <laughs> can somebody somewhere please change the can metric on this? somebody in 701 um, please help? 
Well, I think, yes. I mean, isn't okay. I, but, it's been a, it's been a hot minute, but like in the decision logic, if you have equal, you know, as a tiebreaker, like isn't loopback IP in there somewhere? I think it's like number seven or it eight. is. That's what it was. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It, so yeah. we've got, so how, do we, the, how do we get know, through the like six tiers of the tree? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they're, they're like, no, 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 wait, this is working. See, <laughs> see, we're, we're, we're making a decision. Um, well, okay, so, and so for to the early, the 99% of people that we lost. To the earlier question, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, you asked about the mess versus the beautiful mess. And I think that's like a perfect example of um, there is a beautiful mess in that, yeah, it worked, right? It worked as designed. Like engineering these things wasn't going at, to an LA. Embed, at an embedded software level is like, it's very hard, right? Like you need to have some pretty amazing skills yeah. to do that. But in that moment, you would argue that's the mess, right? My packets are landing in Atlanta when they should be landing in Ashburn. And it's because sort of a higher order element of decision making in the network is, has not been tuned or is not made, doing its job correctly. You're right. And that's where, as in CDN land, we work around it. And in, you know, eyeball land, you go, oh, well. And I think the the thing that well, I know the thing that in eyeball land that we're trying to be much more thoughtful of is, okay, if you have a device or, or a, a so let's just say a software node on the network that maybe has multiple internet connections, you know, and, and you know, 10 years ago, this was not possible, right? Uh, because most people had exactly one internet connection from, you know, some incumbent in their area. We're just starting to see the prevalence now of people having multiple internet connections, right? You will have a maybe a DIA or a broadband coming into a business and then 4G or 5G backup or, you know, Starlink, right? They put a Starlink dish up on the roof and you have this ubiquitous connectivity to, to the network. Like now, now you actually have a reason to start. You have a reason to start making decisions at the edge about how to route traffic. I, I feel like this is a what's old is new thing. Like I had a shotgun, uh, I can't remember what it was. I had a shotgun router between DSL and cable in like 1999 or 2001 or something. Well, I think you were lucky to have two methods of connectivity though. I was lucky that my parents were willing to pay for two methods of connectivity. Sure. That was probably <laughs> accurate. Sure. But I think most, I think if you look around, like most people, most premises to just don't have two paths yeah so how so that's obviously you know i would say something that's very lagging to how prevalent the internet is on those premises right like if you're in retail if you're in food services if you're in anything you need the internet and right. you know the the number of fiber entrances per per unit is not a metric that I've seen much in commercial real estate outside of data centers. So how does that, what does that look like today? If, if you're in one of those spaces and, and you're in a position where, you know, you've got no internal IT, let's say, and you go, well, we, we bought our connection from Verizon or AT&T or whoever, and it's not working very well. We need redundancy. Like what is, do you Google, what is that workflow like for business owners? Is that let me Google how I make my internet suck less? It's a really interesting place, right? There's, there's a couple different things that as we talk to customers, there's a, a few different approaches they employ. So number one is I call my ISP and they need to do something about it, right? Because maybe the ISP is providing, you know, fully, fully managed services into the customer premise. And we see that with like the big, you know, tier one players. Uh, and, and I mean, tier one by subscriber base size, not traditional yeah. definition of a tier one network, but you know, the large eyeball networks that we'll call the, the national providers, you know, they've, um, they've started to build those offerings intrinsically into their businesses, um, either homegrown or, or many of them actually went out and acquired, uh, players in the SD WAN space mm -hmm. to bring those capabilities in house. And then they deliver that as a bundled service. The other place that we see is the business will go to their MSP, right? Their managed service provider and say, Hey, we had, we had a network outage. Um, you know, it took our business down. We couldn't process credit cards. We couldn't place orders. We couldn't, 
you know, stream music. We didn't have guest Wi-Fi. That's like a big deal. Um, you know, despite everyone having a cell phone in their pocket, like we didn't have guest Wi-Fi. That's a problem. Yeah. Um, you know, fix it. And when an MSP is involved, that's where we tend to see uh, backup connectivity showing up in the way of like a diverse carrier circuit, um, 4G LTE, some sort of 5G router, you know, gateway. And then the the this, the edge device becomes like this multi-WAN sort of failover router. The other thing that we see sometimes is the MSP actually comes along and says, yeah, no way, I'm not touching that. You are asking us to diagnose network connectivity issues kind of outside your firewall, outside the demarcation point, if you will. You've and the MSP the wants to, yeah, you've reached, but it's the wrong edge, right? But the MSP yeah. comes along and says, we want nothing to do with that because ISPs have wasted so much time in our business, you know, debugging connectivity problems. Mm -hmm. And so then we see sort of this next layer of like the business owner says, well, this is mission critical to our business. I'm going to take this into my own hands. And then you get, you know, even more of the mess, you know, sort of starts to occur. Um, yeah. And it's a very, like, it's a very interesting space where actually competition and complexity thrives, right? Like, Everything that's sort of running inside the firewall uh, or inside the default gateway at a premise, like that's clearly very much owned maybe by the, 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 the business owner or their MSP or their IT service provider. Yeah. That area that exists between sort of outside that firewall router default gateway and any number of ISP CPEs, demarcation points, it's a gray zone out there in our industry. Some people are happy to touch it. Some people are like, no way, hands off. ISPs have just wasted too much of my time over the years. I'm not touching it. Connectivity is, is my customer's responsibility. And like, is the consolidate, like I think of the US in particular, I mean, Canada is not much different as um, sort of the anti-internet at this point. Like if you go back to your ISP days, right? It was like, how many ISPs can we have in, right. uh, you know, in New Hampshire? That was the, how, how, how big can it get meant how many options can you have right. to, to get a service? And today it seems to, to be like, you know, how big of a pipe can you buy from the one person you can buy a pipe from? Right. And um, I feel like that's hurts that situation, right? It's like you're you're not, there's really no competition in the marketplace in most places for that sort of broadband. I guess the wireless is, is letting the same people <laughs> compete against each other in a different way, but. Well, I think 10 years ago, Matt, we were always talking about the last mile, right? What's going on in the last mile of the network and how do we get more investment into the last mile? Because that's really the constraint, you know, in the network at this point. Yeah. I think that's still true today. I think that, you know, a bunch of the wireless technologies that we've seen come out in the last five, 10 years is changing that, right? <laughs> you know, I've been asked a million times, well, what's your 5G strategy? And it's like, I don't, I don't have one. I'm not involved in that. But our 5G strat, you know, a, a potential 5G strategy is that, you know, this, this democratization of the last mile via airwaves and sort of this opening of the last mile due to airwaves is actually good for all of us, because it allows more sort of natural competition at an end site to exist, which I, I don't think we had that even five years ago. No, I mean, the last time we had it was probably when you were doing support tickets in Manchester, right? Like, right. Over was, right. Because because look, look at the change, change right? Dial, dial was this natural sort of capability for me to, you know, my switching cost of changing my ISP was extremely low in the world mm -hmm. of dial up. Yeah. Yeah, like, uh, I, you know, I compare what we have to any time I look at, you know, our traveling in like Brazil, right? And it's like, there's there's 10,000 ISPs, each with six, you know, 600 subscribers. And I'm like, ah, it's like the good old days. Right. Um, exactly. Or is it? I don't know. Like, I don't know if, if it would be better if we were still um, in a world where there, there weren't, there wasn't sort of a, a monopolistic 
thing that happens because most monopolies are as much as there's problems with them most of them are good at investing in infrastructure because they've now got a really strong economic incentive because nobody can compete with them in some way they've they've earned the right to do that yeah right i mean i think that i think that question space exists i mean a lot of what's going on in you know web two versus web three is this notion of like centralization of the internet versus decentralization of the internet yeah. And that's occurring at many, many layers, right? Like we have the big, you know, the big cloud providers. You could argue that's a centralization of the internet. Well, the, the consolidation of, you know, ISPs in New Hampshire is another sort of dimension of centralization of the internet. Um, you know, something that I, I really sort of push and pull with this topic and I can, I, I can get from a, from a stance standpoint, I can see it from both sides, but just look at what goes on with the major recursive DNS players that are out there, mm. uh, you know, in the internet. I mean, that is a centralization strategy around the DNS, the, the recursive layer of the DNS system that was intended to be highly, highly, highly decentralized. Now, comparatively speaking, like who runs a better recursive DNS service? Like, me well, and my Raspberry Pi or somebody who does it every day? I don't know. That's an interesting, I hadn't thought about it. Like, if you, if you actually group all of the things together, it's actually quite an interesting situation. If you just stick with like the number of eyeball subscribers, let's say for Comcast, uh, you know, Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, Cox, Charter. Yeah. Uh, then say Google DNS, Open DNS, uh, Quad9 and Cloudflare. Right. Uh, and just say AWS US East one. Yeah, sure. Sure. Like, th- yeah, th- like what is the, what number, is the captive uh, the number cone of... around that? Exactly. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. It's big. It's a lot. It's big. It's big. Yeah. Right. Is I that... mean so I mean wh- we we know that that is true, right? When, when anybody along that value chain, right, from the, the cloud provider to the DNS providers to the access providers, like when anybody has a bad day, like we globally hear about that and it's like their experience is the internet is down, right? right? It's not like we had a pocket of a problem somewhere in the network like we used to. No, it's like the internet is down. Yeah. Well, and, and I go back and forth on this as somebody who, you know, comp- competes uh, a little bit with the cloud is I, I was having this conversation, I think on the last episode of the podcast with somebody, I was like, it, f- it feels like if it wasn't the internet and it wasn't technology, it wouldn't be good if you're in retail or if there's a retail space and all of the retailers all sourced from the same wholesaler, because when that wholesaler is having a bad day, uh, quarter, month, whatever, in the dirt world analogy, right? Then nobody can get inventory. And so you, you the, the person who succeeds is the one who goes, oh, no, I can still get parts because I source from over here. And that's not the same place that everybody sources from. So like even abstracting the technology from it, it would seem bad for consumers and competition for everybody to source car parts uh, you know, from the same one wholesaler, um, because then nobody in the Northeast can get their car fixed for three months when they, that, that wholesaler has a problem. And well, have you got, have you gotten through a podcast yet without the pandemic coming up? Yeah, actually. Um, oh, all right. Well then, then I'm not afraid to break the trend. So, I mean, yeah. let's just look, let's go back to supply chain issues during the pandemic. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, my my wife's in medical devices, right? And so she has a great eye on on the medical rubber gloves, right? Everybody wanted to protect their hands during the pandemic. Yeah, where was the only place in the world really that we could get rubber gloves from? Like it's like it. Yes, there are many wholesalers and many layers of distribution. I'm sure well, all from in China. how a rubber glove gets to your doctor's office, right? All, but guess where it all comes? It all from? comes it's from the same, same thing. It yeah. comes from the same place, and we saw the impact that that had on the world. Yeah, right? yeah. So like I, that's that's one of my um, and the other analogy I had was like also for um, 
you know, if you're just building a, a, a technology company, uh, and, and and I I feel a multitude of ways around it. Like I think it's it's probably fiduciary fiduciarily irresponsible to not build on the cloud if you're starting a startup from zero. Um, but at the same time, I also think it's crazy if you have a you know consumer facing business. The new analogy I have for this is like everything's a cooking competition, right? It's like, let's all use the same ingredients. We all get the same mystery box of ingredients, and now we have to make a better dish. And it was like, okay, that's fine if you're in a cooking competition. But like, if I want a restaurant, I want to go source better ingredients than my competition. Right. I don't want to just have a cooking competition. I want to have a restaurant competition (laughs) where like who can run a better restaurant means who finds better suppliers and who can get fresher ingredients and what can I get that you can't get. And... I feel like the when you build on the cloud and 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 you're committed to staying on the cloud, which is probably the bigger problem, that you're just in this, you know, cooking competition show. You're not trying to run a restaurant. You're trying to to limit what who can build what using the same base uh, technology stack, which is, in my mind, like a cool challenge, but also a weird way to try and compete in business. Like if you're not trying to get better, you know. Um, inventory then what are you competing on right just it's customer service and like you know can my coder you know make make something happen a little bit faster using the same you know aws database as your coder like it it gets weird when i start looking at it through that lens i think the macro sort of you know venture capital view over the past eight, nine years, right? Until last year, ultimately till last year when we saw the giant, well, the end of 22, when we saw the giant clawback, right? Was we're going to give everybody the same common components for the sake of speed to market up the product. And hopefully right. the, the, the product that was created is differentiated enough to get user mass and adoption and a viral effect behind it. Growth at all costs type mentality, and yeah, there there is no consideration to the underlying ingredients because the speed of delivery was so much more important. Right, which is true. Like, and that, that's like I get that. That's why I say it'd be fiduciarily irresponsible to not to not start with that. Oh, it'd be crazy. But at the right. same time, I feel like it's fiduciarily irresponsible to stay once you have scale. That's right. Um, that's right. Yep. And it's like it yep. is. It's a speed hack. It's not a. It's not a cost savings or a no. or an efficiency hack outside of speed, right? Like it, it allows you to move faster, but I don't think it allows you to necessarily move smarter over a 25 year time horizon. For sure. The, the, the efficiency curve does not maintain across the life cycle by any stretch. Yeah. By yeah, any and, stretch. And does that make for more resilient companies? Like I, that's, that's where I get split, right? Is like, if, if you do level the playing field and everybody is always, you know, building on that same basic infrastructure, maybe you do get sort of effects where where you end up with with stronger companies over the long haul because you can't source better ingredients, if you will. But I, I think we, I feel like we've seen this game before in our industry, and and you know, for core cloud compute infrastructure, like we haven't seen the act of this play yet, mm. right? And so what I'm referring to is if we go if we go back. Um, we saw these concentrations of, you know, key uh, functioning web properties on different pockets of infrastructure, right? And I would say it kind of started around, you know, I certainly have some bias to this, but we saw it around authoritative DNS, yep. you know, to start. And we saw the days of, you know, everybody in the authoritative DNS space has a bad day. Dyn has a bad day. Ultra DNS has a bad day. VeriSign had a bad, bad day. All the different you know, auth DNS hosting providers that were out there, they'd have a bad day. They'd leave kind of a crater in the internet for a couple hours at a time. And, you know, we as an industry finally sort of figured out how to do, you know, multi, multi provider authoritative DNS, you know, correctly, sort yeah. of, it, sure. it's still, it's, it's still kind of a, a mess out there um, today. It's, it's interesting. One of the, one of the things that you know, business strategy wise, like did not realize at Dyn uh, what we were enabling our customers to do. But just just go do a survey of the authoritative DNS providers out there today in 2024 that allow uh, Axfer or Ixfer out of their networks. Yeah. 
we always did it at Dyn. We were like, yeah, you just turn that on, whitelist, you know, the IP address of of your secondary, like all day long. Have a great time. Yeah. And um, and I actually tried to, uh, you know, once Oracle bought Dyn and issued their their turn down notices, uh, I was in a role where I had to evaluate alter alternatives for Fastly, and like actually that was very very hard to find, right? Mm. Um. And in the modern sort of cloud native stack, the way, you know, you do that today is you use, you know, a, a series of tools to talk to the DNS providers APIs independently. And you don't sort of rely on the, the non-interoperable yet RFC defined replication mechanism known yeah. as zone transfers that we have in the DNS spec. So, so we saw that, I would say that's like act one, right? Mm-hmm. And I would say in the last 10 years, we saw that game or that, 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 play happen again in content delivery, yep. right? We we all enjoyed a very interesting period of time where as a web property, I used one CDN and the idea of being multi-CDN just, it, it was not possible. There was not sort of common denominator features, parity capabilities across the content delivery platforms that enabled that. And in 2024, like if you, if you are a major web player, like you have to have a multi-CDN strategy but this there is a common set of primitives that you can acquire from all the players to get there i don't think we've seen that happen in cloud yet right like if you look at say fundamental primitives in aws versus azure versus gcp that those toolkits don't look the same right like take Take basic, take basic networking in the cloud yeah. as like a starting point. Like in, in AWS, you have VPC. Mm-hmm. In Google, you have uh, cloud network, I think they call it. And then in Azure, I, I don't even know what they call it in Azure. Yeah. But it's all very, very different. Is that a chicken and egg thing? Like I feel like that's today that stems from the business side, which is, First, we'll give you $100,000 worth of credits, <laughs> right? Like, and then you'll be stuck. Um, well, and, and then that'll be okay with us. Well, first, we're going to give you 100 k in credits to, to, this is going to sound negative, but it's just their business strategy. Like, first, we're going to give you 100 k of credits. And then two, we're going to allow you to use those credits to buy really robust services that, you know, once you build them into your app stack, like good luck ripping them out back for their more, you know, basic form. Right. Right. I mean, like, you know, so I'm, I ran some very, very large data sets in big table and BigQuery over on GCP, right? Like multi petabyte data sets over there over the years. Like, I don't want to have to go build. Do you want to have to go build that? Like, I don't want to go build that. I don't want to go run that. Like, what am I doing? Like, going and installing Hadoop again? (laughs) Like, I'm over it, right? Right. But but is that good from a cost perspective, from a scale perspective? Probably not at the petabyte data set. Let's go back a generation, though. Um, Because I I don't know the answer. I'm just sort of thinking through it now. So, um, if at Fastly you started by giving every customer a hundred thousand dollar credit, how interested would you be in enabling multi CDN? Right. Probably not. Right. Like probably pr- not. Probably not a lot because yep. you, you don't Correct. have a way to recoup your your Correct. sort of customer acquisition cost anymore. Because mm-hmm. um, that's to, to me in in Cloudland again. I don't I don't know which comes first, but you can't say first we're going to give everybody unlimited funds asterisk to build on our stack. And then the next thing we're going to do is let them move it elsewhere. Like that just doesn't, doesn't work. But are they? Yes. But I'll push on that and say like, are those funds even real? Right? Like a hundred thousand dollars of say cloud compute credits for one of the big players, like, at, at that early stage customer scale, like what does that actually translate to for incremental cost for those cloud providers, right? So they're definitely for not- For them or for the customer? <laughs> well, I'm, no, no, for them as the service provider. So truly what is the customer acquisition cost of giving 100K of cloud credits away? I, I have to think it's- Five grand. Pennies, pennies. Yeah, 
Yeah. That's the number that comes to my mind. Five grand. I agree with you. Yeah. But to the customer, so this is like the, um, a lot of this I think has to, has to do with the backend accounting of how you're going to account for your cloud revenue as well. But like, uh, if you ever stayed at a hotel, it's much easier to get somebody to comp you a hundred dollars F and B than $20 off your room night. Um, right. right. Cause the incentives yep. are, are not a lot like F and B is a high margin product who's basically designed to get to be able to give people credits and stuff like that there's and, waste built into the into the pnl for that line 100 and, and most importantly if i'm the manager of a property my bonus is tied to revenue per room night not how That's much right. f and b was given away or not given away right. um so 20 dollars of, of less room revenue that's a big deal a hundred dollars less of f and b revenue eh. well, I, why do i no care yeah. um so that's there's a certain element, I think, that plays into that as well from, from Cloudland, right? As you give 100K credit, but you also record 100K in cloud spend from somebody. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so, yeah, you're right. For, for If you really accounted for it internally as five grand, then, yeah, who cares if it lives on your platform or not your platform? You want people to just like you and stay because they like you. Did you, did you see the announcement? You know, this is maybe 24, 48 hours old about I, Google I has decided I, to I, waive so, egress like, fees if you are leaving their platform. If you're leaving, like, go fill out a form and we may or may not enable it. Like, it, it's right. It's very press releasey at the moment. There wasn't a it whole seems lot of, like, hard. weird. You can make an API call to do everything in Google Cloud except this. For this, you must, uh, you know, contact your sales rep and and do the things and the dance and whatever. Yeah, I, I it's think a, it's, it's good really PR. Weird. It's good PR, right? Sure. Because 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 it's it's worth noting they're not saying, "Hey, we're screwing people." Or screwing people is the wrong word. They're not saying, "Hey, listen, you know, egress fees are the fountain soda of our product, and we're making ninety nine point nine nine percent margin on this." And uh, they're not saying that that's bad or that there's anything wrong with that. They're saying using that to lock you into us when you're trying to leave is bad. Is bad. Right? The previous 364 days, we're okay with charging you out the nose for egress. But today, now that you want to leave, we realize egress fees are unfair and you know you, sh- you shouldn't have to pay those. And so because you're leaving... You know, this is our way of of endearing ourselves to you on the way out the door, which is a good strategy, right? The way people feel about you is is how you made them feel on day one, and and how you made them feel on the last day. Um, so w- somebody who leaves probably infinitely now more likely to go back to Google in the future, even after they've left. You know, boring the hotel analogy, um, right? If they've treated me well, you know, after I've had a bad stay. I'm right. way more likely at to the come end back. of my stay. Yeah, yeah. I guess I think of it though is it's it's an interesting you know whitewash of the problem space because at least from what I think about, depending upon how you architected your stack, say inside GCP, like if you've used their pure IaaS products, compute storage network, fine. Maybe that actually that's that that lowering of that egress bar is relevant to you. But if you've used any of the sort of the higher level PaaS stack items your or, or uh, technologies, your cost of switching is so high that unless your data set is some ungodly, you know, multi-petabyte data set, I think the egress fees are just kind of a drop in the, drop in the bucket at that point, I think. Yeah. I haven't run the math, but I, gutturally, that's where I land. Well, I mean, realistically, it's... Uh unless you've built some weird stuff using some weird primitives, fundamentally what they're talking about is your cost to move to a different object store. Yes. Right. That's the only thing. That right. Like f- with the egress fee. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. like fundamentally you're like, Hey, you've got seven petabytes on our, <laughs> on our object storage. And if you want to move seven petabytes, well, that's going to cost you X. Um, and I think that's the first case. And, and the we'll- latter cases, if you get seven petabytes in big table, big query and any of the other sort of like platform, you know, GCP customized, opinionated data storage platforms, then you have a different problem. And I would say that the egress fee waiver is irrelevant to the decision-making process. Financial. Right. It's, it, it's, Financial. Truthfully, it, 
truthfully, it only really helps if you've already gotten that data back on object storage. Like it's still the that's object right. storage problem, right? If you're, <laughs> that's right. If you're stuck trying to get it out of big table, you're in, you're in no man's land. It's a different place to be, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's an interesting, um, I, I like your like your word, but like it is an interesting whitewash of, of acknowledging that egress fees are a limiter, right? And can cause a ton of pain, but saying we will only relieve that pain if you're abandoning us right. is an, right. is an odd, right. uh, not well, that look at the, it, but that's how I, I mean, look of, at the, look at just the, the, the pop-up of companies that exist in our industry now to attempt to optimize and solve, you know, the egress fee problem, right? You have the whole segment of, you know, from from traditional internet exchange operators trying to solve it to, you know, the 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 large, well-connected data center players that are trying to, you know, offer various fabric solutions to solving it, you know, to um, the the cloud providers themselves, to the network, you know, the network as a service segment. Like we have spent a good amount of time in our industry, you know, essentially trying to solve an issue that is technically solved by, a, I'm going to really dumb it down, technically solved by a cross connect mm -hmm. and, and from a business perspective, a far more complex beast. Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's because once you're on it, like, like if you're AWS today, and I don't know why I always go to AWS, but I always just go to AWS. If you're AWS today, imagine sitting in a boardroom and going, okay, everybody, this year we're going to make $5 billion in on egress charges. Should we discount it 10% or 70%? Right. Uh, how about none? I'll, how about none? How about exactly? Um, I'll go with none because that exactly. would because it's material it's a material amount of money for us to not and, charge this anymore. And also where is the customer going to go? Right? Like am I right. am I going to bring my own DIA circuit to the AWS data center somehow? Like nope, it's not going to happen. Uh, that's that's a, Yeah, there, there's no incentive. A, a, a there's no incentive, but B it doesn't make it any stickier if you reduce it, right? It probably goes the other way. Um, and and realistically, the competition isn't doing it either for the same reasons. Like Oracle's cheaper um, and, and or cheap, I would say. Maybe Oracle's even cheap. Um, but that that's the active business strategy to to attract people, right? Is like, yeah. hey, so like the competition exists. It's not like the marketplace. Um, yeah, the market's not... I mean, the market's not broken per se, but the incentive structure is really complex to navigate, right? Because the flip yeah. to it is there's, you know, we know that there's plenty of our friends, right, in the industry that, you know, bare metal hosting providers that they're like, yeah, mm -hmm. have all the egress you want. Have a great, you know, knock yourself out. You know, the bandwidth is there. It's the utility. Like our moat, our profit margin comes from, from elsewhere, you know, space, yeah. power, compute, storage, you know, that's where we're going to charge you. It's not in the bandwidth. But now we're back to the problem of like, well, I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to go stand up Hadoop again. Right. Well, it's, it's funny. I had Avi on and he managed to not drop this line. But like I, he always had the best line for me for this, which was bandwidth is a marketing expense. <laughs> right. Uh, like if you're if you're if you want to be in, in, you know, bare metal IAF, bandwidth is a marketing expense. Yeah. Um, against the cloud right it's like hey what's a cheaper way to acquire the customer like oracle's doing right there's no reason oracle is uh, has lower egress fees other than they're using it as marketing to try and attract to buy customers using bandwidth which is a to my mind a good strategy and they have probably been successful with the big bandwidth users and naturally therefore also not super uh not super effective with not the big bandwidth users and that's that's also where i like my brain doesn't fully compute all the time that, you know, people could be using the cloud and not actually using a lot of egress and the egress. Well, I think the I, I, I was just going to say that. I think that's really interesting, right? Like, yeah. um, I think for, uh, uh, I think for folks in our industry who 
are, I guess I would say delivering traffic dominantly in northbound and southbound patterns, right? To the internet, to the eyeball or from the internet, from the eyeball. Yep. In some ways there is a, a lack of appreciation for what happens on the East West in the network. Right. Yep. I mean, you know, well, and part, even part the of premise. what's part of what's interesting for big network for me is I'm seeing a lot more about sort of what's happening in enterprise compute and corporate compute. And, and, you know, some of these clients that I speak to, they're like, yeah, internet, whatever. Like what we care about is what's happening inside the data center or inside the cloud. Yeah. And I think we're getting a taste of that just around, you know, what's going on in, in the realm of the AI workloads where suddenly the East West network is like extremely relevant to these folks again or yeah. to all of us again. Well, and, and it, that again, it's, with my view of the world, everybody's a web scale, you know, everybody's doing web scale stuff, right? So uh, even my premise of like, it's fiduciarily irresponsible to, uh, you know, to, to keep it stuff in the cloud. There's probably a lot of enterprise people who do save a lot of money moving things into the cloud, like compared to having, you know, Bob and Susie and Tim run your on-prem data center uh, in 700 square feet down the hall where you buy Dell product at MSRP and then pay an extra 50% for support. And, you know, you're, you're, you're buying cat five cables for $50 a foot and, <laughs> and, 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 um, like, yeah, there's, there's probably those people go, Holy crap. Look, what I we mean, saved. I would be selling you the gold plated cat eights. Let's be let's sorry. Be yes. I'm, yes. I'm a few generations behind yeah. of, yeah. of my, my you cats. Know, with, with the dielectric bypass ballon on the end of it, just to make it go. So the bits flow faster. Right. Well, you need that for consistency. Well, it align, it turns the one sideways so they go through faster, right? That, well, it's a cross thing, right? Like the, <laughs> like it's once it gets into the queue, like these ones just go <laughs> right. through faster. Yeah. <laughs> But like th- that is a that is a large group of IT buyers that is probably oh, yeah. larger than web scale, you know, overall, and they do probably save money doing cloud absolutely, things. Um, absolutely. So it's absolutely. it's a blind spot for me that that because I start from the premise that everybody's doing all these efficient things, and then sure you, you do the same other thing over here that's less efficient, and then you go, why would you do that thing? Well, I think it's it's a DNA thing, right? Like fundamentally, like you know, you and and others, like we're infrastructure builders, right? So right. like, like we fundamentally understand how we get literally from like, you know, either a submarine cable in the ocean to a concrete pad on the ground and a building and, you know, utility feeds, right? All of these things that are coming into these ingredients that make these hyperscale data centers exist. So that's sort of one mindset to approach this from. And then there's another mindset a more and i would say a more traditional mindset where it management is really a risk management function it's not about building it's a risk management function so why am i paying msrp to dell because it's it's a risk management function and when i need a part on site in four hours i have the backing of the supply chain of maybe dell or hpe or whoever to back me up for that as a as an it risk management function and it's not part like it's part of the reason for that exact thing is it's also not part of Cox, right? right. It's like, this isn't part of delivering my product. This, oh, 100%. Is, this is below yeah. the line. So hundred percent below is the, line. where's the yep. bloat going to be? Is it going to, is there uh-huh. bloat in Cogs or is there bloat going to be below the line? It's all going to be below uh-huh. the line. And uh, what is, what is my investor? What are, what do my shareholders care about? Right? Because there's, there's, you know, we know this from the venture capital community. There's plenty of folks who look at the bottom line and hey this is SaaS and we know that we have a multi-year investment and we're going to lose on the bottom line but as long as you know as long as the the gross margin uh line and you know gross margin percentage is growing and up to the right we're happy yep yeah and and it is a strategy like i told people all the time i said i can i can grow as fast as cloudflare if you let me lose 430 million a quarter like sure uh that's a it's a really easy way to buy customers losing 430 million at a time um, but at some point the math, the math needs to balance, right? Or not in like in VC land, you go, well, we're going to get out before, before the math needs to balance and somebody else is going to hold the bag and somebody else is going to hold the bag. hundred yeah. yeah. percent. Yep. Oh, let's, let's, I want to do a slight pivot because I'm actually sure. quite interested in this. Um, one of the things you've chosen not to build in the cloud is your home lab. Tell me, tell everybody 
what your home lab data center looks like? Because I don't think I know the full scope either. So I want to know exactly what this looks like. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, let's let's totally acknowledge that this comes from a place of uh, dorkage and geekdom. And there is no efficiency coming from this, like whatsoever. Um, but yeah, so I, I have a, I have a home lab. Uh, it is, it is three cabinets. It has its own dedicated room with, you know, air conditioning. Uh, it, uh, it has a 16 KVA Symmetra LX extended run UPS tower. <laughs> um, we do deliver utility and UPS backed circuits to every rack. Uh, you know, 12020s, 12030s, uh, 24020s, 24030s, you know, any choice you might have for all of three racks. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, uh, that is in turn backed by, you know, a Kohler propane generator with an ATS and that is all monitored for shutdown. Um, let's see, we have, uh, uh, for a network stack. See, I'm going to lose all geek points with this. Like for oh. a network stack, we have, we, we can, have, we can bleep we, it out if we have, to yeah, we, we, we do have a uh, ubiquity dream machine pro SEs on the edge of the network. That's fine. Uh, you know, I get some geek points for it. It's not like it's, you know, just, just say zero. that you're going to refresh it to something later, right? That's the current stack. I'm going to refresh it to my, HPE green uh, enabled routing stack. HPE routers. And, that sounds great. And I, and I need to install like the ink cartridges for the packets to go through. It'll be, mm. it'll be great. Mm. Um, yeah, no. Uh, so we got that going on. Uh, and really like that, that networking stack is there because, you know, a couple racks over. Yeah. There's like a couple MX one Oh fours. There's a couple, uh, EX 3200s. There's some QFX 5100s in the, the rack. HPE, all the HPE. Yes, all the <laughs> HP, HP networking gear. Um, so the ubiquity sort of ingress, egress out of this home lab is there because if I'm on a plane and something goes wrong, I can like pull out my phone and like fix it. Um, a little bit harder to like SSH from my phone into formerly Junos equipment. Yeah, and then... And then uh, two compute racks, a uh, bunch of one RU Dells, um, one cluster running Proxmox 7, and a new cluster starting to run uh, Proxmox 8. Um, and, you know, going down the Proxmox 8 plus Ceph uh, rabbit hole for the, for the new cluster. And, uh, and then the you're going to run cluster. Hadoop inside. In, yeah, inside totally going to run some. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, and then uh, let's see the the old cluster for backing storage just uses like a Synology, a souped up Synology NAS that has an iSCSI target on it. So, mm. yeah, I like that's, there's that's there's the story something, of the home lab. There's something I wish we I wish I knew more about the psychological breakdowns because there's something interesting about the, um, shall we call it, industrial level uh, or data center level utility stack that then goes into the consumer grade uh, right. equipment yes. right like it's yeah. like i yeah. am going to bi- i'm going to build you can at least give me prosumer grade compi- prosumer yeah it was not it, i wasn't trying to yeah. disparage no the, i know i know yeah i know but that's an interesting because that's what i would do too right i would like obsess yeah. about uh obsess about you know my diversity of power feeds or internet feeds or whatever and then plug it into my Unify or Synology or something that doesn't really isn't expecting deliver the, itself deliver level the of, same level right yeah right right yeah hmm. and I mean and there's how, there's a there's a lot of various ingress egress paths I mean so it's weird this this particular location um, uh, Breeze Line and Comcast got into a wonderful competitive match with one another in the region and they actually got one overbuilt the other. Mm. And so it's a very unique location in that we actually have, you know, two cable internet services available. And then, you know, we threw Starlink up on the roof. Yeah. And what's funny about this is that the Ubiquity stack only gives me two WAN ports. Right. So I can't, I don't even have the capability of all the failover that I want. 
Yeah. And so then there's a number of big network appliances that get involved in order to get the full brunt of failover yeah. uh, capability for certain, ne- for certain, I would say, non-consumer segments of the network. Right. Right. So if you're, if you're hanging out on, you know, particular SSIDs in this home, it is vanilla as can be, just let the dream machine do its job. Yep. If you're on other SSIDs or other hardwired VLANs, then there's a lot more complexity going on in that network to take full of you know take full advantage of the connectivity oh, that's stuff. available. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Which what is your home like if if you're working on your laptop or desktop? Which are you connected to the complexity or are you connected to the con- prosumer? I am connected to the complexity. Okay. Yeah, my SSID is the complexity. Got but, it. You know, wife, kids, family members, guests. Yep. They are connected to something as plain and vanilla as possible. Got it. Right. I mean, it's definitely like a, a cobbler shoes or ch- sure. what is it? Cobbler's children's, yeah, cobbler's children's shoes problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how impressed would high school? Oh my God. I can't wait to see the T1 line uh, version of Tom be with like. Like I'm desensitized to the fact that I walk around now. I'm desensitized to it, to the fact that there's a phone in my pocket that can download at you know OC one ninety two speeds, right. uh, relatively, you know, normally through the course of a day. But when I like take one step back, like it is like you know, from oh my god, you have a T one, right? Or holy crap, at Easy News we've got three T threes. Right. Um, to like, yeah, I get upset when my phone's speed test is less than, you know, 400 megabits per second and I swap SIMs and whatever, because how dare <laughs> when it, you do that you know, too? So. I do the same thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is that like, yeah, like don't, don't we... underestimate the awesomeness of like two eSIMs on your phone. It is amazing. Right. Yeah. Would, would high school you like, could you have foreseen if, if, if you had written down and maybe you have, <clears throat> cause you're that kind of thinker, but like if I had written down, this is what the internet will be like in 2024. I don't know that I, in, in say the year 2000, I don't know that I would have, I would have actually c- predicted the continual jump of say bandwidth capacity, either over RF or fiber or like that, that would blow, that would blow 20 year old me's mind for sure. I think. Oh, for sure. I mean, just, I mean, you can go look at a chart of this. I mean, think about the time, just go back, Matt, think about the time that, you know, where did, where did you start? I started, I think with a 2400 baud. I was, I ISA, had a, an ISA 2400 baud. Yeah. Right? I had 2400 baud modems for BBS. Yeah. And so think about the time it took to go from a 2400 baud modem. I went, I went 2400 to a 14, four, I think I jumped to a 33.6 and then it was the realm of, you the know, all the 56 K or 56 X2 V92 stuff. Right. Yeah. So like, what was the innovation cycle to go from, you know, using the same units 2.4 K bit to 56 K bit. Like yeah. we're talking six or seven years, something like right? that. And then what was, what was the innovation cycle from, you know, uh, Let's ignore 40 gigabit Ethernet because it probably shouldn't have existed. Um, but 10, just 10 to 100, right? Right. That, well, that was I'm, 80. I mean, 1980, early, mid 80s, first 10, 10 megabit. 10, 10 gigabit to 100? Oh, sorry. I thought you said 10 megabit. Yeah, um, sorry. Ten, yeah, 10 gigabit to 100. I mean, well, 10 gigabit to 100. I mean, 10, 10 gig was not prevalent till 20. 20 12, 13, 14 in there? 12. Yeah, the 10s yeah. sometime. Yeah. yeah and, and now, now it's... How, and now we're rolling four hundos, right? Yeah. Like it... But that's do crazy. You have, any, have you put any 400 in your network yet? We don't We don't have any 400 um, just because we have, have, have been resisting of buying the next generation of hardware. Right. Um, right. But like my pet peeve, this is like... Have you ever seen that pie graph... Uh, that shows up at least on my LinkedIn feed periodically. It's like, you know, what I thought success looked like. And it was like a pie graph and it's like 99% hard work and 1% luck or something. And then it's like how to actually be successful. And it's like 20% sleep, 15% yeah. diet, exercise. Yeah. I-, I have one of those for like what it's like to run a CDN. Sure. 
And in my brain, it's like, you know, what are my CDN costs? And like 99% of the pie chart is bandwidth and 1% is everything else. And that's like, I got stuck in 1999 or 2000 when that was sure. the case. And today I'm like, well, you know, my number one cost is cross connects. Yeah. Um, oh, 100%. And so I'm very pro, hey, if we can collapse cross connects four for one. Right. Um, let's do it. Let's do, let's it. do it. Because. Yeah especially because we slash I've been around so long, like my, I've paid $80,000 for cross connect. Like I've got cross connects. If you know, we installed in 2004 that we've paid $80,000 for like what? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's very interesting to sort of study like our peer group in the industry because you know, there's some folks who they will, they will literally do so much engineering work to make sure that they never have to stand up yet another cross connect, whether it's, you know, there's so many formulations, right? Like, you know, buy die and DWDM and then like, you know, roll your own, roll your own passive, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, we, we've studied it a number of ways just, okay, well, I'm going to start putting colored optics into my edge devices and I'm going to, put a mux on both sides and I'm just going to, you know, pair up the colored optics on both sides. I mean, what an operational nightmare, but well, what an amazing but the, but the, OPEX savings. Sh- sure. But there's your, that's still in, for in, in my land, that's East West, right? Which right. is like, it doesn't really help me. Like, I don't, I don't have too many cross connects to myself. The, the cross connects that live forever or the ones that keep needing to be upgraded are, are all to the interwebs. Right. And it's, I, I don't know, like my, and in, in infrastructure land, that's the 99, that's the fountain soda oh, yeah. of, of the data center, right? Is like, you know, they spent $104 installing that cross connect, including labor and fiber. And I've paid them $82,000 for it. Actually, I, I, I can, I want to push back on that. I, I, I learned something a couple years back. Okay. And I guarantee that they did not spend $104 installing that cross connect, maybe $104 in hard material. Yeah. But there was one particular data center that, and I'm not going to say who I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but they accidentally sent me an internal documentation when the, and an an internal document when they completed one of my cross connects. Yeah. Now I ordered, I ordered four single mode cross connect pairs. Yeah. What I got back from them was 88 pages of method of procedure. Okay. And you're, this is going to blow your mind. It's 88 pages. Each MOP is 22 pages, but I ordered four cross connects. So I got right. 88 pages in total. Right. Yeah. And it is a 22 page scanned document per cross connect of the mes- method of procedure for deploying the cross connect into the data center with handwritten, like in a pen on a clipboard in the data center, like checked Check. notes, date, time, and initialed line by line to run a single mode cross connect pair across the data center. So maybe it's not $104. Like just the, like what is the labor cost of filling out 22 pages of documentation? Well, then, at, then we're, you know, a then reasonable we're at, hourly rate for the tech. Sure. We're, then we're at, t- at always at the core question, which is, is it a union building or not a union building? We have to start there. And maybe we've finally justified the cost of the cross connect install fee. Maybe, Maybe. but even then, I still think it's it's, because it's paperwork. I still think it's paid by the install fee. I don't think they're recouping it on year seven. They're not. Yeah, Uh, for sure. For sure. But like that's and and like I stand on principle now on like cross connect stuff. Like every time I I've made so many bad decisions just on principle. Right. Like I need my cross connects to go down one hundred dollars each. And they're you know, we can't do that. And they're like, but that would save you three thousand a month. What if we discounted this, this and this to thirty two hundred a month? I'll go, no, screw that. No, nope. nope. I, I want the cross connects because right. they're going to live forever. <laughs> right. And, and you, and you are a special in your line of work. I mean, you're a very special type of customer where your ratio essentially of like cross connect to physical space, to power density or power consumption. Right. Is way different, right? Like going back to the fountain soda, you are consuming an incredible amount of fountain soda. Compared right. to like, other customers. What I like to think of is what we call the ideal customer. Um, yep. And yet, 
you know, they would they would tell me that they would rather have somebody buying more power and that person could get lower cross connect charges because, you know, their spend was on power over here. And I'm just like, and I get it. And I'm happy to throw, you know, my least favorite vendor under the bus. So like I get that Equinix is a REIT now, right? Like, like everything else, like what we talked about before we got in there, it all, it's just Matt's world of psychoses that it all comes from, right? In my brain. No, but it. Equinix sure, is a bunch but, but of, it, but but they're like, where does it matter in the PNL? Right. Well, because in my brain, Equinix is a bunch of my friends, um, mm-hmm. you know, who are super smart and clueful and building this cool startup in out of the Bay Area, and I'm stuck in 2005, where all of the things I'm asking for make logical sense to the people I'm asking, I'm talking to. Right. Today, Equinix is a 90 billion dollar REIT, and what are they acting like? Like a ninety billion dollar, like they're acting like exactly, yeah, exactly what they are. Exactly. Um, and and, the, and your my problem I'm is sure my perception ex- of them is that they're not a ninety billion dollar REIT. They're they're Equinix. They're the disruptors. And I'm sure your extensive knowledge of the real estate market enables you to have a perspective on their business that you know helps you understand exactly where they're coming from. Right. I mean, I, all I know is I understand I'm paying you eighty thousand dollars a cross connect. <laughs> so, like. I get that I'm a terrible I, customer because I'm not. You need to go cancel that cross connect, Matt. Like I, I think you might just want to have a new one put in. I don't think that'll help because it's it's only eighty thousand dollars because I'm still paying eighty bucks a month. Uh, I mean I'm not there yet, but that's that's sort of my per, my perspective, right? It's like I don't want to cancel them because the old ones at least were legacy pricing, you know, incrementing five percent compounding. If I had well, to start, I, I got to tell you, like that. That psychosis. I mean, I have a very similar, you know, problem in my head of just like the cost of bandwidth. I mean, I was buying, you know, bulk wholesale bandwidth um, in the data center on, you know, literally on net where it was like, yeah, it's my router plugged into your router. And chances are the packets that matter are going across your back. Direct plane. They're not board. even going over your, your, your backbone. And, you know, now being like on the edge like looking at what goes on in the the retail bandwidth space, you know, out in the built environment is just a a totally different, you know, world. What you know, what do you, what do you mean you're buying DIA for double digit dollar per megabit on the P95? Like, like that's how it that's how I look at peering today, right? Like I'm peering because I'm doing a good thing for the eyeball network. Right? Because for whatever reason, they're still paying what they're paying for transit. Mm-hmm. It's not cheaper for me to move a bit from transit to peering. There's no chance. It's it's in every way possible. It's always more expensive to serve it over an exchange or PNI less so, but let's say an exchange uh, than than transit. But like you sort of, that's sort of the elegant mess of the internet argument, right? Is like it doesn't really serve me per se, but it serves me to have functioning ISPs that are happy to receive my traffic. Therefore. Um, you know, we'll pay more to deliver it to something that costs them 10 times less, right? Um, right? Whereas it costs us double, let's say. Um, so I, and I don't know if that's just the gravity of content, right? Like like you're, the experience of, of the edge edge, um, I, I, don't, I don't know anybody who's ever paid less as an eyeball network than somebody I know paying at a comparable scale that's on the content side. Like it seems to push people pushing bandwidth are always paying less. I think that's right. I think, um, I think that there's a lot of, I think that there's a lot of infrastructure costs that maybe the, I, I know this to be true, that on the content side, you just don't see right. That you rack up when you get out into the built beyond the data center's built environment, right? I mean, right. have you been following have you been following what James John is doing over at Toradex? I mean, he is yeah. He is tearing up the streets of Boston of of... Boston and Somerville to fix the interconnection ecosystem that's out there. And yeah. you know, like having a very very large backhoe show up and an operator and insurance is not cheap. Right? And you got to you got to make that that those costs back somehow sure so it's it's but like it's just totally different investment life cycle times that exist amongst these different types of entities that ultimately make up the internet 
Sure. But like in, in my example, I'm thinking of like ISPs I know, mm-hmm. right? Like who, who are already carrying all that CapEx to deliver it to their customers. I'm saying inside the same colo as me, they're getting a cross connect from carrier X and I'm getting a cross connect from carrier X and I'm paying to push into carrier X yep. and they're receiving, they're paying to receive from carrier X yep. and carrier yep. X is delivering both of them over a cross connect. Carrier right. X is charging them 15 X. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they also have all the CapEx and, and whatever behind that cross connect on their side. Like it'd be different if carrier X had to deliver it to their, you know, uh, head end in the middle Up of nowhere in, right. or something. Right. Yeah, it is. It is. It is an interesting quandary. Like, what what makes it different? It's the, it's the content is king argument, uh, but less so for for internet traffic and and or for uh, web web eyeball traffic and more for. I don't know. I mean, I I was always told by uh, a select group of our of our inter of my former interconnect partners that that the eyeball is king. So it should be. You know, which right? which one is it? Which one is it? Well, I mean, I, I know I know who's being offered, um, you know, I know who's being offered free ports on exchanges to come there, and it's not eyeballs. It's true. Right? So true. Uh, yep. that's the. They're, they're, I mean, would that so so would that change? Like, what if maybe on an exchange we flip that paradigm around? Like, how does the eco? How does the development of the ecosystem change if the paradigm on the on the exchange operators part flips to free ports for eyeballs and content needs to pay well then i'm really 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 not moving stuff to the exchange <laughs> right because the only reason i'm moving stuff to the exchange today is it somehow benefits the eyeballs True. um right yeah, like re- I, realistically and, and you're upstream yeah i mean you're then then in a way you're shifting that to your upstream transit provider correct at that point or you're yeah. i mean at the end of the get, day the goal is- or you're just trying to get density to to drop a, a cross connect Right. The goal is to get to the PNI, but that now I'm in a world where the PNI cost me 80 grand over the next, <laughs> over many years, right. right? And now we're back to would I rather have a 400, like, and N by 100 doesn't sound very exciting, or N by oh. or 10 doesn't sound very exciting. No. Um, no. no. It's I spent spent too much time just doing like 8 by 10, 10 by 10 grooms to 1 by 100. It's like, I'm, I'm good. Right. Yeah, but I mean, that's... Eight hundred thousand dollar cost savings, <laughs> right? Okay. Like it's 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 a good investment. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm overstating the 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 economics a little bit, but I did the math on one of them. Like I've had one in Miami that cost me seventy grand since two thousand three or whatever. Um, the total the total lifetime of the cross connect for sure. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. and, uh, and you can cheat the number by periodically disconnecting them and ordering new ones and saying the this this one only cost me a thousand and this one cost me a thousand and this one cost me a thousand. But at some point, but yeah, that's that's my. So that's my pet peeve. Dot 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 is, uh, is just like I don't want to pay crazy numbers for cross connects. I would rather pay you more for power, um, and and does it matter to you if instead of making ninety nine percent margin on the cross connect, you make ninety eight point two percent? Because either way, this is this is fountain soda for you, and uh, for me, it's not my fountain soda. It's my my lunch money. Uh, so I'm trying to allocate it in a way that, you know, works for both of us. And now have and, you been, have you been present in an, in an environment where, uh, you know, the, the co-location provider offered, cause there, there's some out there free cross connects, right. Or, or you pay for a, an installation fee, right. Yep. But then there's no long-term, uh, monthly recurring charge on the cross connect. And, and, you know, if you have, have you ever experienced like a fundamental difference in the product? No, I mean, yes, we, yes, yes, we are in facilities where there's just an NRC for cross connects. Um, uh, two, no, I have not noticed a uh, quality of service difference between the monthly recurring fiber and the uh, the ones and zeros. All do seem to come in the same direction. Um, they do. Okay, good, good. Um, what What about if there's a you know if the if there's a a cut on the cross connect or, or, you know, there's a problem with the cross connect of some kind. It's a good question. I mean, cause uh, I've, I've heard this pitch before. Oh, well you're paying a, a, an MRC on the cross connect because when you call us at 3 AM, we have somebody sitting there who's going to go fix your cross. Oh God. That's like the, oh, that's, I've that's heard like, it. That's I, you've like, heard it. I've, I've heard that's but that's like the unnamed Equinix vice president. You know who you are, uh, who, you know, said, oh, I can't give you that pricing. It would be unfair to my other customers. 
I was just like, uh, I don't have the suspicion. I don't know. We just uh, we just clearly identified that the transit providers are doing it. Yeah, it's like I I don't have a spot in my P and L for how other companies' emotions, but I appreciate that you're thinking about that. Um, I don't know. I mean, we've had we've had fiber go bad. That's been on NRC. I can't say I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to say that it's gone faster or slower to get it resolved based on the MRC. But that's an interesting. Maybe I would. Just, to get my money's worth, maybe I need to con- conduct fire drills uh, every week or two and just, hey, please take this cross connect down and do an end to end test because that's what I'm paying you an MRC for. I'm pretty sure you're going to pay a smart hands fee for that. Sorry, a hands So what fee. am I paying the MRC Sorry, for? I, I'm pretty sure you're going to pay a hands fee for that. What am I paying the MRC pretty for then? <laughs> that's that's my, my counter to that, right? Is like if the <laughs> MRC doesn't actually include my ability to get a, a misbehaving fiber certified then you can't say i'm receiving that right i'm gonna pay if i'm gonna pay smart hands for an nrc or smart hands for an mrc i choose to pay smart hands for an nrc thank you so so if we extend that paradigm right to the outside planet i mean so if i am you know i'm up in new hampshire so predominant electric companies here are eversource and unitil and um the co-op Right. I'm tra- chances are if it's my poll, I'm charging uh Comcast, Breezeline, uh consolidated communications a fee each month to attach to my poll. Yeah. I mean, should the power companies who are putting the poll in the ground stop charging the other utility providers a fee to attach to the poll? Well, now we're back. Because once that, that wire on the poll, it's a cross connect, right? Well, now we're back to the it, so this goes back to like the ISP consolidation thing. Yeah. Um, I think the, the answer for utilities specifically depend if you're a government regulated monopoly or not. Um, how did you get that right of way? Uh, like, how did you get to put your poll there? That's my first question. Um, if you paid nothing because as part of your agreement with the government being a monopoly, you get to use, uh, you get rights of way besides highways and beside highways and et cetera then I'm not sure you get to charge other people for your, I mean, maybe they should pay, but it shouldn't be to you. Uh, I would think it should go to whoever's right of way you're using. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's kind of my, uh, I don't have a problem with monopolies. I, I don't need government, government, government regulated monopolies are a different thing. However, right? Like, Hey, Microsoft is a monopoly. Why? Because they built a better product than everybody else. Okay, well, I think they should get to throw their weight around. Um, you know, Comcast is a monopoly. Why? The Telecom Bureau of uh, Massachusetts said they are. Okay, well, th- now there have to be some different things that Comcast has to do that's different from yep. becoming a monopoly by doing business better. Right. Um, right. Yeah, you're you're so, looking for the like, you're I, looking for that that improvement. That true improvement to the value chain as opposed to the monopoly solely for the sake of existing at the right place at the right time. Correct. So like uh, it, to the original question is like should should somebody pay for for um, you know for access to the polls? Sure, but I don't know who, who they should be paying, right? Because that the utility didn't actually do anything that gave them that, right? That was granted. Um, but it's an interesting question, right? It's like Along along the way, somebody's getting paid somewhere, mm-hmm. um, and and by the way, I'm not saying I should get my cross connects for free. Um, you know, I'm I'm just saying I want to pay less than what I'm currently paying, and but more than I know other people are paying, including myself through another entity. Um, right? Like you know, I can reorder this cross connect as a resale the great over here. Gamification of this, absolutely. Right. Right. Like, right. can yeah. I at least get the twenty percent you would give me if I resold it to myself? Well, I mean, great question on that, right? Like, look at the, look at the, we've, we've seen this time and time in, in colo environments, right? I can't get contiguous space. I can't get contiguous cabs. So, you know, the, the intra customer cross connect does not mm-hmm. have an MRC, right? Was the model I always saw. Well, what fundamentally yep. makes that product different than the inter customer cross connect? Like, I uh, do I don't know. Because it's allowing them to sell this much lower product, lower margin product. That's back to the, I'd rather you buy power from me. Right. Um, 
Right. Right. It's like if all you're going to buy from me is cross connects, I have to charge you lots of money for them. If you're going to buy lots of power from me, I'll give you free cross connects. I'm like, but your margin on power is nowhere. Like, but I think it's I think what we're what we're driving at, Matt, is like it's it's this space power cooling and connectivity all are required to have a to having a functional data center environment, right? Right. And and every player in that ecosystem is going to optimize and maximize for different dimensions of that four legged stool. Right. hundred percent. And and there are different in uh, economic incentives to which leg of the stool you choose to optimize for. Right. And, and, and right. again, it's, it's me projecting onto other people, right? Like my philosophy is like your allegiance should be to maximizing your highest margin product. It, it, listen, if you're well, making 99% that's not, that margin, on, like it's probably cross connects, right? Uh, but if you're making 99% margin on power, then you should be, you should be treating power that way too. Right. But, but, but that is not the economic incentives, right? There's people right. saying, it's how not, do you know it's who's not a, the so, It's not the soda fountain product, It's not the soda right? fountain, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, Subway doesn't sell, uh, Subway and McDonald's don't compare soda sales to decide who's a bigger That's right. um, entity. In the same way for, in data center, it's not how many cross connects you, did you deliver last month. It's how many, you know, how many megawatts are you building? Um, how many megawatts are sold? What percentage of space right. is sold? Right. Um, in my mind, if a more sophisticated investor or analyst would be going, how many cross connects did you sell? Because that's what pays for the whole business. That's, that's what's paying for all of it. Um, exactly. But yep. instead, it's like, oh, we've got more megawatts. Well, um, I mean, the, and we, we called Fountain Soda, you know, the when you title this podcast, you should probably call it, you know, fountain, drinking fountain the soda. fountain soda, drinking yeah. the fountain soda. I don't drink fountain soda. But, well, no, I don't. But, um, but go back to, to egress costs, right? Egress fees yeah. from the core cloud providers. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's just that, you know, what, what does your, what, what do you have to maximize to create shareholder value that you publicly sort of report on versus like what's out there in the ether around the business that is actually the profit margin. Sure. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure AWS's economic picture looks very very different without egress fees inside their business it has, has to. to has, has to. to right i mean that's yeah, not would, kind of an obvious statement that's going to be very boring for our listeners but yeah it, well, it is interesting to study because aws does not at least in any of the public reporting i've heard they don't talk about you know revenue derived from egress it's correct. all about instances and storage and services and like i have seen people work i always th thought this was an interesting math equation but i have seen people work back like capex payback on uh server instances with with mm -hmm. within aws or, or cloud and i'm like the capex payback on a switch port has to be measured in seconds oh it's gotta be like like yes. after 11 seconds we have now paid for this <laughs> network device and and maybe that maybe that's just the uh, my uh skewed way of looking at the world but like everybody's like oh my god it's such a great business they you know they they're, they're making the capex back on a server in six months and i'm like six months you know how many switch ports they could deliver yeah. for the same <laughs> right right yeah. craziness yep. oh and and even just when you look at yeah i mean we could rat hole down that for a while i was gonna say if you just look at the the evolution of the network topology i mean you do it in a way that doesn't have the big expensive you know, what was it? Raz said, help my big expensive router is really big and expensive. <laughs> like you don't have the big expensive router port anymore. Right. Yeah. Now it's, now it's, uh, SDN, uh, it's just a whole bunch SD of software. SDN port costs. Yeah. Well, and, and, but there's also who know, like in the same way that there's a 22 page, uh, SOP for deliver cross connect. Uh, internally, we had this conversation not that long ago where somebody was like, you know, cattle, not pets. And I'm like, sure, but there's a level of infrastructure providing the cattleness here that's supported by like 100,000 AWS engines. Like we don't have just like a cattle button for bare metal that makes everything just magically uh, cattle-y, right? There's, there's actually a ton of uh, overhead in making it so that something can be cattle. You can't just say words like cattle not pets and all of a sudden you know your home lab configures itself oh man how do i how do i get that that would be i would like that yeah um yeah. It's, so like, it is interesting like you know i like uh, 
you know, I'll, I'll take the like hashtag grumpy old man title for this. This is just grumpy um, old man shaking fist at clouds. Right? Yeah, right. But but you know, you look at where does where does where does infrastructure start depending upon your role in an organization, right? If I am a developer, like where does infrastructure start? For me, does it start with maybe like an internal pass service that I can request my infrastructure from? And maybe I've just sort of uploaded a Terraform package uh, to it and I get the environment that I need. Or maybe, you know, infrastructure starts with me as, you know, let's go back to the chef day, knife EC2 create, right? Yeah. Or or the AWS CLI. Um, or does infrastructure start with me of, of getting a VM with like a base OS installed on it. And it's funny if we even just get to like the at scale, not individually, but at scale, just blowing down an OS to a box and all the primitives that sit underneath that. And you take a cattle mentality to that. That's still like a lot of code. Yeah. Like it's a lot. And there's a lot of complexity in there. That's not like how many lines of code, how many lines of code are in chef? Oh, I wish Adam was here to tell us, but it, right, but a few, it, couple million. I'm thinking, right. So it's like, right, the, the, it's it's not free, right? Like to, it is so that the abstractions are not free, right, right, and, and and forget the OS, right? Like let's just get down to even the BMC, the management controller. Like, like I have <laughs> in my career, uh, I have not yet fully enjoyed the full leverage of the BMC. I don't know if you have, but like, I I have not paid for the open managed license. I have no intention of paying for the open managed license. Um, you know, I am also not paying for the ILO license, and I've never had the joy of working with that that tool suite. Uh, yeah, but I have interacted with it, and I do know sort of like in my mind how broken it is. I mean, uh, the use of the word enjoy there, I feel like was a, nobody's, nobody's actually going to be able to answer yes, uh, with the, with that word in there, but you know, it's terrible. Like it's in, and, and nobody has enjoyed it. Uh, and, and, and even the people who have wielded it, um, which might be a better word, uh, not in a way that actually covered all the use cases and fixed all the things they needed it to fix. Right. Like it's, right. Right. um, well, what is it? I mean, the, 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 uh, I am, I mean the, a modern Intel CPU, right? Like let's go down to the primitive. How many lines of Minix is running inside the modern Intel CPU? It's massive. And what's the surface of that? Right. So it is, it is fascinating in that regard. The, um, have you taken a look at the Oxide folks at all? Mm-mm. So I, I think it's uh, Oxide.computer is the website. Yeah. And these are folks who have just said, like, we're, we're throwing it all away. Like, we're, we're going to start with the CPU and rebuild the entire ecosystem of the motherboard and the periphery bus and the BIOS and, you know, booting, booting an OS from scratch. And it's fantastic to study um, what they're doing. Yeah, but like you, you can't. Uh, like I get it, it's but it's a, like an academic exercise at this point, right? Like it's not going to. They they're shipping racks. It's very interesting okay. to look at. Well, it's not academic yeah. then. Yeah, it's definitely not it's not academic. List. It's it's worth checking out. But you know, I mean, like they're like we're going to start with the primitive that is that is the processor, not the reference. You no, know, not the Intel or AMD reference design for the board. And let's see how we rebuild the value chain around the CPU. It's pretty right. interesting. Well, and and who's the market for them? Is it is it me? Like, is it is it people? Is it hyperscalers? Like, who's there? Mm-hmm. And I don't know because I mean, look, the hyperscalers have already built their own, right? Like, look at I look at Nitro, right? Right? They they built their own. I think it is the folks that That's, have hyperscale needs, but in a private cloud, and don't want to go. So back people to who need to run Hadoop, Hadoop, yeah, yeah, in their home lab. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting. Okay, I have to. I'll investigate that. We'll put that in the show notes too. Um, uh, side note: I it occurred to me yesterday or two days before that still ten thousand times in my life, 
uh, every year do I type check IP dot dyn DNS dot org. Um, this is why this is the most random thing, but is Oracle paying to run that for me? Wow. Like did somebody carve that out in an acquisition agreement or like, why does that service still work? So it works because without, <laughs> without that service, uh, dyn DNS support breaks. Right. Mm. So it serves a couple of different functions. One, one uh, so, so consumer grade router firmware is a terrible, terrible place in the world. Right. Um, it is horrific. And it goes back to incentive alignment, right? If you think about a product manager at a consumer grade device manufacturer, notice that I said device manufacturer, not software developer or soft software product owner their job is to just ship the next you know units edition of the of the router right this this week seems to be the week of uh wi-fi 7 buzz with ces being around right like you yeah. know every uh product manager has been thinking about how do i get a wi-fi 7 chip on my router so i can get into the consumer's hands as quickly as possible and i just need the software to make the wi-fi 7 chip so uh, checkip.90.org exists for two reasons. One, uh, it's there for uh, NAT traversal, right? So, or, or NAT detection, I should say. So if you were sitting behind a NAT and you needed to update your dynadios.org um, record to a publicly available WAN IP, you would use CheckIP in order to um, in order to detect that that NAT. The second yeah. reason it exists is um, because of how sort of broken this software development process is with consumer grade CPEs. And the brokenness is that the team that was implementing the Dyn DNS update client didn't know how to talk to the team that was responsible for WAN configuration on the box. And so they couldn't actually read the WAN side IP inside their own yeah. software stack. It was just easier to make a request out to the internet and detect your IP. Okay, but I think I think I learned something here that was my question. So Oracle hasn't sunsetted Dyn DNS. They sunsetted Dynect. That's right. That's right. If you still want to go get a DynDNS.org host name in 2024, yeah. like go do it. Really? Yeah. yeah. Swipe your credit card. Give Oracle the money. Wow. That's yeah. a I, I don't talking about incentives. I don't know they, how that would have Oracle transpired. ran a, a 2023 holiday promotion on dyndns.org like credits. Like you could type in a coupon code into the cart when you were checking out. That like, I would like to, to chalk it up to altruism, but like that blows my mind that Oracle made a decision of like, let's get rid of the enterprise DNS product that people use for commerce and let's make sure we continue to support people's dynamic dns updating i have a feeling i i have no data to back this claim up but um if if dynds.org were to go away tomorrow the global ip video surveillance mm. business would crumble so let me let me get this in my worldview then so what you're telling me is if dyn dns went away larry couldn't look at the video surveillance on his uh, yacht anymore yeah you're probably right and as a result of that the service still lives could be could yeah. very well be that's crazy could that's very a, well be that's actually yeah. pretty cool okay i gotta go to the mailbag here because we've been we've been uh uh covering way too many things and uh Two questions here from the mailbag. Cue the mailbag music, please, Mr. Producer. First question related. Um, what was it like to, uh, this is from Bill. Uh, what was it like to watch something that you were uh, a part of being swallowed up by something like Oracle? I think that there's a, a natural like life cycle to companies that occur. Right. Um, I had a, I had a prof in graduate school that was like, you know, companies have, companies have life cycles. Um, 
and they have different approaches to things. And, and a lot of times in technology, you either grow or die, right? And, you know, I think we've all heard that, that phrase before, grow or die. Uh, I think that, you know, Oracle swallowing up dying the way it did was like the next, the next step in growing or dying. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, people would ask me questions like, well, you know, someone is coming along and, and, and taking your baby. Right. And, and maybe 20 year old Tom would have like a very different emotional reaction to that. I have two kids at this point. Um, and so like, that is a, that just means something viscerally fundamentally very different to me of like having your baby taken from you. And I know what I would, I, I know what I would do for my kids. Right. And, and at least in, in my worldview, a company is just a very different thing than my kids are. So, um, don't get me wrong. It's very important to me. Um, you know, when I do hear the stories from, from friends and former customers that, you know, Hey, Oracle killed off Dynact and, you know, there isn't another thing like it. Um, I deeply sympathize and empathize with that as a former Dynect, you know, customer in my last role. Yeah. Um, it saddens me that the service that, you know, is awesome. It's an awesome DNS platform. doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it's not my baby. And there is a certain life cycle of a company. And, you know, when you get to a certain size and scale, you do grow or die. And this both grew and died. <laughs> well, you could say it, you could say it died. I mean, that's one way to think of it. Yeah. But, but being able to be behind the curtain a little bit, like I know that there in 2024, there is code running <laughs> that I wrote a very little bit of it, but that the developers that I worked with to build Dynac platform, um, in a, in a piece of software called Tutor. That is still running inside Oracle today. It's just supporting the OCI cloud business and no longer a publicly available authoritative DNS provider. So I don't know that it died. Right. Maybe maybe it died and reincarnated. There you go. I like that. Uh, okay. Second question. Um, well, I so, I so this person didn't know the, your ISP background, but. Um, Coming from uh, coming from the infrastructure space, uh, what is the biggest thing that's different operating in the ISP world at, at big networks? Great question. Um, so the <laughs> the data center, despite the cost of cross connects, um, <laughs> the data center is like this. For the most part, data centers have bad days too, but for the most part, the data center is a pretty protected, nice, functional environment. You know, d data centers definitely have bad days. Uh, chillers get ripped off of roofs. They lose power. Um, what else have we had? Water leaks, um, cooling systems going down, earthquakes, um, people cutting holes in the wall to steal the servers. Did people like, pressing the EPO. Pre oh, yes. People bumping into the EPO switch thinking it's the door release switch. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I forgot about that one. Um, they're, they're pretty nice environments. And the, the connectivity inside them is also quite nice. Um, in the ISP world and, and working with ISPs and, and helping to support uh, build software for, you know, the tier two and tier threes that are out there. Um, there, the conditions of their networks are far more extreme and wide ranging than the day to day, you know, environment inside the data center. Um, mm -hmm. they are, are up against, you know, uh, let's see, uh, car accidents, hitting telephone poles, fiber cuts, um, people stomping on their airwaves in the wireless world. Um, you know, every, every animal that exists out there, squirrels, Anything that can dig, birds, dig or chew. Dig, chew, yeah, dig, chew. I mean, so I think that they're like, they're like, you know, I, I have a, well, well, Jen, uh, who I mentioned at the top of the podcast, I mean, he's, he's building fiber to the home in Northern New Hampshire right now. And, you know, like 
in my mind, getting out the fiber splicer is like a big deal. Like I can only think of a handful of times in the data center environment where we were really getting out the fiber splicer. And that was to do, you know, pigtails on bulk fiber for big build environments. And, you know, we had 14 inches of snow come through here uh, a week ago. And like he sent some pictures of his folks out there, like splicing fiber like it was every day. Yeah. Right. So it's just a totally different sort of operating environment um, and a lot less sort of protected inherent resilience to the environment because you're you're just interfacing with the built world. And right. yeah. you know a backhoe is going to find your fiber, period. Right. One way or another, it's going to find you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is a, a, you might be the exception that proves the rule. I think. Um, what were you like as a student? Ooh, what? How so? Like academically? Sure. However you. Yeah, I mean, characterize yourself. You know, uh, like a, a, I would say above average and kind of a rule follower. Mm. Um, and then you know, like definitely, I was definitely like the AV nerd kid that like fixed the computer and made the projector work and turned the TV on and you know that sort of thing yeah you were you were uh, useful useful uh, for for your local school system I'll, I'll tell you my parents were not pleased the day that my middle school principal uh, pulled me out of class to uh, assist assist him, assist him actually do the work of ripping his like CD changer out of his car after he had gotten into a car accident. They were like, you, mm. you went, you went, he drove you where and how'd you do what during class? I don't understand. So mm. yeah, I, I, useful is a, is a good word. Yeah. yeah. You said you saved, uh, you saved them having to hire seven uh, adults basically. Well, to, whatever to do this, right. Yeah, yeah. Probably like, you know, six hours of work and 125 bucks an hour for car, car work, car electronics work. Yeah. Like I had the to funny thing was, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, well, we got some bolts, we got some nuts, we got some cables. Like, I guess I'm just going to unplug them, you know, yeah, like, absolutely. it'll be fine. Yeah. Like my, in grade five, grade five and, and a little bit in grade six, my school got like all brand new Apple two E's. I had, I've never used an Apple product in my whole life. And yet uh, I spent, you know, the back half of, of grade five, just going from classroom to classroom, installing stuff on Apple just, IIe's in all the classrooms sure, because sure. somebody had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we were, uh, we were parishioners at a local church and my mom was the office manager for, you know, taking collection for the week and doing various mailings and getting the bulletin out. And they had a, geez, we had a, like a, I think they had a, a Wang 8088 and a leading edge 8086 maybe and yeah. like one day the the pastor handed me like two isa 8-bit 10 base 2 ethernet cards and was like can you make these work and like it was weird because i don't think there was actually a business reason to do this but he just like handed me the cards and like a bnc cable and was like can you go make this work somehow i i don't know sure hmm. like, let's go go figure it out you know that's it right well that's the, just the, like just the press enter man computers, just, the just press enter like it like the worst you're gonna do is like wipe your hard drive out pro hopefully hopefully that's worse i guess not in 2024 no you can do no. you can do worse things now you can do safer things too yes i assume everybody has a some sort of apple backup of their laptop at any given time but i do love the time machine it is weird though like now that i think about it, like every phone on earth is backed up but time machine doesn't really get back anything up i'm not sure, sure why that is yeah my um, phone my phone and ipad are definitely backed up to the yeah. cloud but my laptop i don't know yeah, actually, you gotta, you gotta can, roll your own yeah you do that's weird um do you think it it like new hampshire was a not a hub of technology uh things at least it, it, compared to a Silicon Valley or New York or, um, you know, today's Austin and all the sort of startup-y places. Was that, did that help help or hurt Dine? And, it, it would, and for you growing up, did that help or hurt you as like computer geek? I have seen it through both lenses, right? 
I mean, we had a we had an early consultant at Dine uh, who came in and sat down with our leadership team and saw what we were doing. And he had just gotten off of a large assignment at Yahoo out in Sunnyvale and came and sat in our Manchester, New Hampshire office and was like, why are you here? Like, you should be dead. Like, you should be dried up grass. Like, I don't understand how you're, how you're doing this from here. But, you know, let's, let's go back and let's look at, you know, innovation in the internet. Well, okay. Where was BB at? Right. The folks who built the imp, you know, it is, it is literally an hour away from Manchester. Um, you know, if you look at Cabletron systems, you know, one of the big first networking players, I mean, they ultimately lost to Cisco, right? But where was Cabletron headquartered? Rochester, New Hampshire, right? If you look at, you know, Digital Equipment Corporation, um, you know, who came out with the Alpha processor, which was just sunset, I think, last year, right? One of the world's first uh, 32-bit CPUs. Uh, Marlboro, Massachusetts. Marlboro is an hour and a half away. So I I don't think of this so much as a access and availability problem. Uh, it was very much more a marketing and branding problem. We just didn't, mm. this, this area never sort of put that, there was never the Silicon Valley stamp of the East right. on greater New England. So, so no, I mean, yes and no, right? Like, to have a successful business, you need good marketing and good branding. There's no doubt about it. Sales doesn't happen without it. I mean, you you know, you're you're a business owner. You know this, Matt. Um, I don't. All I know about is cross connects. I don't know anything about. <laughs> <those>. <laughs> um, so, you know, <clears throat> we didn't have the brand, but we had we didn't have the brand and the identity, but we certainly mm-hmm. had the engineers and the minds and the capabilities. And how about you personally, like you, obviously you found a mentor and you, you got into the ISP space, but, uh, would it have been different if, if it was a bigger is the wrong word, but more saturated market? Um, it's hard to say because I didn't live that experience. Right. So I can only sort of like project and guess, um, you know. There is certainly something to be said for, you know, in the Silicon Valley area, being able to say, like, bump into somebody like Stuart Cheshire from Apple, right, who, you know, maybe in an informal environment and have a conversation, right? Stuart was one of the chief architects behind, like, the rendezvous protocol and something today that we call multicast DNS, which kind of looks like dine DNS inside of a LAN, right? And have long known Stuart and we've had a few interactions along the way, but they've always been very formal. They've always been organized. So I think, it. I think, yes, is there some opportunity loss by not sitting in Silicon Valley, maybe from an access standpoint? Sure, of course. I mean, that's 3000 miles away, but you know, the flip side to that is, you know, in the story of dying, like we really stood out for our local area and we were seen as a a cornerstone of technology development in Manchester, New Hampshire. Whereas in Silicon Valley, we probably just would have been one of, you know, many dozens of companies operating in that environment. Sure. Yeah. And you, and I guess you could also say you would have been one of the many thousands of people hoping to bump into him, uh, on a given day, right? Like it's exactly. Yeah. You get a little, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, but, um, you know, we lived the experience we lived in, it was a great experience. Yeah. We we're very lucky. Okay. Before we wrap up, it's story time with Tom. Uh, you can choose whether this is uh, what order you, you answer these in, but we'll stick to bus- business world. Um, what was your worst day and what was your best day? Huh. Bottom of the barrel. Worst day? Bottom of the barrel, worst day. Yeah. Um, There's a public incident report on this that you can look up, so I can talk about it. Um, We were were making some adjustments to traffic routing at Fastly 
um, using our authoritative DNS system. So Fastly has a two-tier, at the time had a two-tier um, steering traffic steering system. One of the layers was, you know, uh, an authoritative DNS platform that that performed, you know, GOIP like lookups and mapping based upon recursive DNS resolver um, uh, source IPs. And um, we literally pressed the wrong button and did not have the right safety um, in the software platform. And so we routed global Fastly customer traffic through a single pop in Tokyo, Japan, which is basically like trying to drink the Pacific Ocean through like a plastic straw from the soda fountain. You really do need to name this the soda fountain talk. Like it's <laughs> clearly this is what we've gone for. It's going to be either that or cross connects. I don't probably, know yeah, The problem theme. Um, yeah. So like, you know, multiple, multiple terabits of traffic that all need to be processed and handled by the Tokyo pop. And, you know, like we lit it on fire basically from a CPU and network bandwidth consumption standpoint and caused a very, very large outage at the time. Outages happen, but the worst part of it was that it was also the morning of our semi-annual customer summit in San Francisco. And so we had, you know, a room of three, four, five hundred of our most beloved and important customers um, prepped to be in the room at eight o'clock in the morning when this outage happened somewhere around, you know, four, five, six o'clock. And, you know, we... One thing Fastly does is we take outages extremely seriously and, and the team takes them like it, it happens at a very, very deep personal level. And, and that, you know, that's a whole other podcast about sort of the emotional response to an outage. Sure. But um, I volunteered to go apologize that morning to our customer base and, um, you know, stand, stand up in front of a room with, you know, 800 eyeballs looking at you and apologize for um, something that should have easily been caught by uh, smarter software um, in the platform. Um, it, it's a gutting, it's a gutting experience. The, the apology tour is not fun. No. Um, and, you know, that combined with the texts from friends and family of like the internet is down. It's like, no, the internet's not down. It's just we're down, but we happen to be a big part of the internet today and you use all those services. Um, yeah, not, not, not fun. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I've had many, many outages over the years, um, but sort of the, 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 the public eyeball or, or not even the public eyeball, the very, very sort of uh, direct experience because normally you have a phone in between you have a zoom call you get an email you get a ticket you got something yeah but this was like you know 800 eyeballs of laser um cutting into you yeah um writing not, in our not, not writing and experience. posting an rfo is not quite the same as as talking to a human right right yeah i was convinced i was running into like a like an angry mob that morning yeah. um so, so that's probably worse um <laughs> best uh best on the other hand um you know it that that's a hard one i mean there's there's been a lot um i think uh due, due to a multitude of like mishap circumstances and and my and my son who was really little at the time um bryce was he would have been four um at the time of this. So Bryce, <laughs> the morning, the morning of Fastly's IPO, uh, let's just say Bryce had some pretty serious tummy troubles. Mm. And, um, you know, for a four year old, you can read in between the lines as to what that, that results in, but due to a, a whole bunch of like miss happening circumstances, um, my kids were never supposed to be with me on the floor of the stock exchange as they ran the, the closing bell the, the morning of the IPO. But again, due to the tummy troubles, yep. um, I had my kids on the floor with me um, at the uh, at the closing bell on the stock exchange. And they actually showed up on, on CNBC that night. And it's not the notoriety of them showing up on CNBC um, or anything like that that I'm talking about. It was just 
actually for me, everything that was going on, there was an ability to sort of just be there with my kids yeah. and have them be present in that moment with me. That yeah. was very special because otherwise I would have been standing there alone. Families were supposed to be up in the mezzanine inside the stock exchange. Yep. And, and again, due to Bryce's stomach mishap, um, both my kids, Grace and Bryce, got to join me right there in that moment. And I got to have my hands around them as the closing bell rang. That's awesome. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It sounds it happened exactly how it was supposed to happen. It sounds like. I mean, I don't know what we fed them, but it wasn't. That was yeah. not the plan. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to wrap it up. Tom, thank you. Uh, Thanks, Matt. For your chatting with you. wisdom experience and and uh, for taking over as host and, and walking me through some of my uh, business trauma. Um, <laughs> your cross-connect psychosis. Absolutely. Yeah, that is it. Um, Absolutely. I hope to see you in person sooner than later, but thank you uh, nice. as always. Thank you. Cheers. This is Cheers. Different. Another round. So much more to talk about. Gonna aim to satisfy with the help from Cash Fly. Get to it, to it fast. Right here. On the Anycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here. On the Anycast. The Anycast Podcast. Brought to you by Cash Fly. Cash Fly.